Welcome to Superintendent Radio Network. I'm Guy Cipriano, the editor-in-chief of Golf Course Industry Magazine. This is the fifth episode in our Disease Discussion podcast series we're producing in partnership with BASF. Joining us on this episode are Dr. Richard Latin, a professor of plant pathology at Purdue University, Kyle Miller, a senior technical specialist for BASF. For those that are familiar with the series, these were also the first two guests that we had on the Disease Discussion podcast series. This episode is going to be a bit different than some of the previous ones. Dr. Latin and Kyle are going to offer tactics for developing a rock-solid disease resistance plan on your course. We'd like to thank BASF for supporting this podcast. BASF is always in the disease discussion with numerous solutions to help superintendents control a variety of diseases. Visit betterturf.basf.us for more information. Now on to our conversation with Dr. Latin and Kyle. Well, Dr. Latin and Kyle, it's great to have you on the podcast again. And we spoke back in March about dollar spot insensitivity to DMIs and the fit for Maxima and Navicon. We want to continue that discussion, but also discuss what you learned in 2020 and elaborate on understanding responsible fungicide programs to maximize disease control and long-term utility of fungicides. First for you, Dr. Latin, how's the year been with regard to dollar spot pressure and other diseases? Well, uh, up in the Midwest, I think uh, the pressure has been typical of a, of a year um, of a Midwestern summer. Uh, this year is a little bit warmer than most, so we saw a, a little bit more brown patch than we had in the past in some of the warmer uh, the diseases that occur in warmer weather. But dollar spot pressure was, was quite high. Wherever there was moisture, we had plenty of dollar spot pressure, and it continues uh, right up to the present time. And how about you, Kyle? What are your observations on 2020? Well, I'll tell you what, I feel like uh, it's been a buffet of diseases for me this year. You know, I cover from Virginia up into New England and the Midwest. And not only have we had dollar spot, but anthracnose and summer patch, uh, take all patch, fairy ring has been very prevalent. Uh, it's definitely been a hot summer throughout much of the North with some areas having more than adequate rainfall while we've had others a little bit on the, the dry side. But uh, with that heat and humidity, Pythium has also been uh, quite prevalent in the northern U.S. Pythium up north, Kyle? And what are some of the challenges that poses? Yeah, so, I mean, that's one of those diseases that if you're not right on top of it, you can get a lot of turf damage very, very quickly. So superintendents, though, as a rule, uh, I feel like we're prepared and put down preventative sprays before they had any kind of an outbreak. Uh, but if they didn't, it was definitely there and definitely caused a problem for them. And, and they had to do things to uh, try to stop it uh, in its path. So, Kyle, this is the first full year that Max Team and Navicon have been out there for superintendents to use. What have your observations been with those two products and how have they performed in 2020? Obviously, I, I haven't been able to get out and visit golf courses like I usually do, but uh, I've been in, in touch with the sales reps that I work with and, and, and superintendents. And the good thing is it's been pretty quiet as far as on, on a negative front, which means the products have, have performed really up to expectations. Um, I feel like the common theme that I'm hearing from all the sales reps out there uh, has been the superintendents telling them, you've really got something here. Uh, so they've been very, very pleased. Uh, I know that a number of them have shared success stories uh, with our sales reps, with me on dollar spot control, the length of control, the fact that it's very good preventative, the fact that it's very good curative. And I mentioned fairy ring earlier, and uh, we've, we've had a number of superintendents using both Maxima and Navicon to get some really good fairy ring control. Dr. Latin, obviously controlling diseases requires a good rotation and program. In your mind, what is the objective of a fungicide rotation? Well, uh, good question there. The, the objective of the effective rotation. In short, it's to achieve good disease control, uh, of course, while minimizing the, resist, the risk of fungicide resistance. And in terms of good disease control, uh, I would say uh, each spray should include uh, effective active ingredients, 
applied at the appropriate rates at the appropriate time. And uh, uh, with regard to reduced resistance risk, we must be uh, mindful that successive sprays must avoid the repeat of the same active ingredients or the same class of fungicides. And we should limit the amount of any active ingredient throughout the entire program, trying to reduce that resistance risk. And, you know, uh, considering the array of all of the disease threats that we have throughout the season, developing an effective program from both of those standpoints, good disease control and reducing resistance risk, it does become quite the challenge. And Dr. Latin, building off that answer, are, are all fungicides prone to the evolution or development of fungicide resistance? That's another good question. I suspect that this would be a review question for most superintendents, and I would just want to reinforce what they already know. Um, only those fungicides that have a single site mode of action are vulnerable to the evolution of resistance or development of resistance strengths. So we know that most of the modern fungicides have those single site modes of action. And we should also recognize that there are only a handful of pathogens that are prone to the development of, uh, of resistance to fungicides. They happen to be pathogens that cause very important diseases, dollar spot, anthracnose, pythium blight, gray leaf spot, and microdochium patch, or the pink snow mold, uh, that, that uh, has developed great pressure in the Pacific Northwest. So not all fungicides, most of the modern ones, those with single site modes of action. Before we get back to Dr. Latin and Kyle, now is a good time to remind our listeners that Maxtima fungicide and Navicon intrinsic brand fungicide from BSF control the toughest diseases, including DMI-resistant dollar spot. Both products offer strong residual and advanced turf grass safety at economical price points. Use Maxtima fungicide and Navicon intrinsic brand fungicide in your rotation to help control a broad spectrum of cool and warm season diseases. How does resistance develop? And from what I understand, it's a multi-step process. Right. It's, it's actually a two-step process. And we've gone over this a couple of times in our educational programs. But think of that first is, is the mutation, that change in the pathogen population that renders a strain or a cell no longer sensitive to the active ingredient. So in the presence of that active ingredient, it has a competitive advantage. Okay. It's not affected by it and it just continues to grow. Now, that's the first step, the development of the mutation, and it normally occurs or normally appears in very large pathogen populations. We have a blow up of the pathogen population. Now, the second step is one I think we're all uh, uh, aware of, and that is the what we call selection pressure. And in a practical terms, that means applying the same fungicide uh, too often or over and over again which gives that mutant strain such a competitive advantage that it increases in the frequency in the population to the point that the fungicide no longer works to, the, to stop fungal growth and infection continues and we get uh, poor, uh, poor turf quality, uh, disease outbreak, and, and the fungicide essentially fails. I, I would say, say this, that there is no issue in turf disease management where knowledge is advancing more rapidly than the understanding of the details of fungicide resistance. Now, what we just talked about above, uh, the single site mode of action, the types of diseases that are prone to resistance, the two-step process of resistance, the mutation and selection pressure, those are standards. Those hold true. But we're also learning some other things that maybe we'll discuss later on in this discussion. Yep, let's get to one of those right now. How do application rates influence the rise of resistance? Uh, this is one that's, that's important, and this is at, sort of at the cutting edge. You know, we've known for a long time that the low application rate, rates affect the selection pressure step, okay? Low rates will reduce the selection pressure, uh, and so they'll slow down the rise of the completely resistant strains, but also they're less effective. Right? So they'll allow a little bit more disease to occur. So what you trade off in, in, uh, in selection pressure, uh, the pathogen gains in, 
terms of controlling more disease. Now, one of the things that we're learning from research in in fungicide resistance in, in crops uh, 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 where they use the same fungicides that we have in turf, we're learning that low concentrations of fungicides um, may actually affect the mutation rate of the pathogen or how fast the pathogen can mutate. In other words, uh, you know, we're, we're, um, we're familiar with the old saying, what doesn't kill you only makes you stronger. Okay, so what happens is when you lose, use a low concentration or low, low rate of, of fungicide, you, you may not kill a fungal cell or the fungus, right? But you're going to damage the DNA. And when that, that DNA is damaged, it, it, it's really the, the, the very root of change in a population is a change, some change in the DNA. Now, most of those changes in DNA, which is, <clears throat> which is another word for mutation, most of the changes in the DNA or the mutations are lethal. In, in that the cell won't survive, but some do survive. And if we're talking about billions of cells out there, which let's imagine a fairway full of dollar spot, we're talking billions of cells, right? So uh, the lower rates may cause changes in that DNA, and when the pathogen starts growing again, it may, may be likely to increase the number of mutants that are out there in that population. This is, like I said, at the forefront of our knowledge about uh, effects of fungicides on development of resistant populations. And it's something we need to consider about, uh, you know, how we manage disease with our fungicides. Guy, I've, I've got a comment to add, too, is by using full rates of our fungicides, we're giving that fungicide the very best opportunity to control that pathogen. And I think that's very, very important because we don't want any of, of uh, you know, the pathogen, quote, slipping by the gates, if you will, because that's what, that's what leads to resistance. So let's make sure we're good and responsible and using, uh, you know, lethal rates of our uh, fungicides to control the diseases that we're targeting. Dr. Latin, how do different approaches to fungicide scheduling influence resistance? Uh, this one is a no-brainer. You know, let's take two different approaches. Let's call it a preventative approach pre-outbreak where the disease isn't, isn't uh, uh, apparent yet and the, the so-called curative approach where the outbreak has already occurred. If you apply the preventative approach, you maintain low populations. And if you have low populations, you're going to have less disease and there's less likely chance for resistance developing. On the other hand, if you schedule fungicide uh, applications according to, let's say, a curative uh, approach, whereas you let the outbreak occur, and when you see signs of the disease, maybe you think the first sign of disease. And actually, you know, disease development, pathogen development is like a, an iceberg. What you see is just the tip of that iceberg. So there's this massive population down below. So if the scheduling is sort of post-outbreak or curative, you're applying fungicides really to a massive population. And when you do that, the likelihood of resistant strains is much higher and the likelihood of a, a fast-developing resistant population is much greater. And what about tank mixing? How does tank mixing influence resistance? Dr. Latin. That's a good question. To tank mixing or pre-mixing fungicides, we're using more than one active ingredient to, you know, uh, in a single uh, in a single mix. I would say, in general, applying more than one active ingredient in the single spray is advisable uh, because it reduces selection pressure, right? Uh, than any uh, on any single active ingredient in the mix, and it, it reinforces what Kyle just said about. Uh, knocking those populations down and giving the fungicide the best chance to control that pathogen population. When I say different active ingredients, I guess I, I also would refer to different classes of fungicides. It would broaden the spectrum of, of activity and uh, I think be more effective against individual cells or strains of the pathogen. But 
that there are several issues I think that we would need to consider when we premix, when we use a premix or when we tank mix. First is, is kind of what we talked about before. If we're applying this mixture curatively, okay, post outbreak, right, then we're exposing all of the active ingredients and all of the classes in that mix to a large population. And I think that puts all of the active ingredients in that, in that mix in jeopardy for the development of resistance. The second issue it deals with the mechanism of resistance. There are actually three me mechanisms that we've identified. One of the mechanisms is called efflux or active efflux, where the pathogen strain actually pumps out the fungicide faster than it can accumulate inside the cell. And, and when that happens, if that is, it doesn't matter what fungicide is in the cell, okay, that fungicide is going to be pumped out faster. And so you're going to get reduced control of all active ingredients in the mix. So uh, this, this pumping mechanism is typical of DMI fungicides. So if we're dealing with, with uh, 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 you know, if historically DMI fungicides have been used, it might be nice to know if it's a, an efflux mechanism that's causing the problem. Uh, the other issue, I guess, well, maybe two more issues. First, if we use lower mix, lower rates in the mixture, right? Instead of using high rates, we use low rates in the mixture, trying to to get some sort of combined effect. We also, if we have large populations, we can affect the mutation rates there. So again, uh, I recommend using the high label rates there and letting the fungicide do the very best job to get that uh, that most complete kill uh, right after the application. And, and I guess the last issue I would consider here is that if we're considering, let's say, fairways and let's say dollar spot, if we're considering six or seven or eight sprays over the entire season and we use, you know, three or more active ingredients or classes per spray, we may run into a situation where one class is overused, okay, and we might be using too much of any single active ingredient, thereby increasing selection pressure and thereby increasing the development of resistance. So in general, to, to summarize, I would say that using the premix or the tank mix is a good policy, but we have to be careful about how we use it uh, in terms of the rates and how often we use it. Kyle, on the research front, is there any new research with regards to DMIs and dollar spot insensitivity occurring right now? Well, Guy, you know, we talked about this back in March uh, a little bit. Uh, you, you know that BASF has done a tremendous amount of work looking at uh, insensitive dollar spot and DMIs. Uh, we've worked with superintendents uh, last fall and this spring on their golf courses where they've had issues. And uh, so far, we've seen very good results uh, using Maxima on DMI insensitive strains. And then also uh, uh, earlier uh, this year, this spring uh, at UMass, Dr. Young and his uh, colleagues had had a, a study that they reported on where they were evaluating Maxima versus uh, propiconazole and tebiconazole two older DMIs, and basically they, they were seeing, Guy, what we've been seeing, and that is that Maxima, it was much, much more active on these insensitive strains than the older DMIs that we're accustomed to using. To the tune of, uh, with propiconazole, uh, Maxima was 22 times more active, and with tebiconazole, 26 times more active. So it's sort of comforting to see that uh, another lab has seen what we've been seeing and that, you know, now superintendents have a tool that uh, they can use to provide a uh, good dollar spot control on these courses that uh, they have issues with uh, insensitivity. Any closing thoughts or final reminders to superintendents from either of you about resistance? Now I have a, just a couple of suggestions, and I think uh, I think this just reinforces what superintendents tend to think anyway. But you know, the first step 
is that we should uh, consider all possible non-chemical methods to reduce populations, reduce pathogen populations. And uh, I would say that I prefer preventative uh, over the curative approach by far. I think the curative is just way too risky. Uh, and, uh, you know, even if you take that, that approach, it may be uh, more, uh, more costly in, in the end. Uh, the other thing is I, I like to, uh, to recommend high rates and, uh, of course, rotate among classes of fungicides. Yeah, and for me, Guy, I, it, it starts with cultural practices, for example. I think everybody gets a boost in the performance of their fungicides when they're doing things like uh, dragging fairways to remove dew, that they've got you know, good fertility out there that they're using the latest nozzle technology to deliver these fungicides uh, to, the, to the turf grass. So try to do all those fundamental things, uh, ag, you know, all the agronomic practices to give your fungicide uh, the very best opportunity to work as well as it. Well, Dr. Latin and Kyle, it was great to have you on the podcast again. And thanks for what both of you do for the industry and for golf course superintendents. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, guys. That was a great conversation with Dr. Latin and Kyle. And before we get going here, one last reminder, EOP is a good time to refer to the rotational spray programs provided by BSF and customized for your specific geo region of the country. It's a spray program for the entire calendar year and considers growing season, climate, key diseases, and resistance management. Ask your BSF sales rep or find them at betterturf.bsf.us behind the solution.